Burr. It's cold out. It is literally like, I think, six degrees Fahrenheit, maybe four or five. I don't know. It's, it's really cold. Um, it's been down in the negatives here Fahrenheit, which, you know, I don't know what that is in Celsius, but I decided it was time to pull out the old welder generator. So this is a ReadyArc D300K. What essentially it is, it's a Lincoln Electric welder generator that was basically dumbed down and made more simple for a rental type fleet. And I picked this up from Mike. I don't know if you remember or not, but I did a tour of an old abandoned junkyard with a lot of old machines and things. This was sitting on that property. If you haven't seen those videos, I'll put a link in the description. Go check those out. Just kind of mind boggling all the things that were at this property. But this was there. Got a monster. Ready arc welder generator. Looks like it's a diesel unit. D300K, three by three. There it is. Wow, doesn't look in terrible condition either. But this was there at that property and I got it from Mike I don't know, maybe a year, year and a half ago, and I haven't done anything with it yet. Kind of been waiting on some of these smaller machines to you to work on them during the winter because it's a little easier to work on them inside. It's not crazy warm in here, but it's 46 to 50 degrees in here. Way better than the five degrees that's outside. So we're gonna dive into this. If you don't know what this is, a welder generator is essentially a mobile generator that you can take out in the field to be able to weld or repair things. So you'd see them on big service trucks, you'd see them on pipelines, you'd see them anywhere where you need a weld and there's not electricity available, a welder generator comes into play. This one, I wanna put one on one of my service trucks. This one might be a little bit big. It has a four cylinder diesel um, engine that runs it. The size is actually probably too big for what I want for the service truck, but nonetheless, it's got its uses and it's got its value just as it is. Uh, maybe throw it on a small trailer or, or something like that. But my plan will be, first off, we're gonna find out if it runs. Mike says that it ran, but I think everything at Mike's property ran when parked and you just never know. And don't have a lot into it. I really don't know anything about it. So you and I are gonna sit down here. We're gonna figure out what this thing is all about. I think he did say at one point that the generator wasn't making electricity. So I'm not sure if it's a brush issue, if there's some sort of contactor or, you know, I'm not sure what's going on with that, but we'll probably have to open that. But we're gonna start one thing at a time. First, let's do a walk around, kind of take a look at it, see what we have here and we'll go from there. All right, like I said, it's a ReadyArg D300K. Can only do stick weld the way it is set up now. I don't have what they call a suitcase for it. A suitcase welder could be hooked to the leads and allows you to have a MIG welder attachment to be able to use it for welding MIG out in the field. 
at some point I'm going to look for one. Mike even said he might have some. Um, I might look into that and see if he's got one he'd be willing to sell me. But from what I know, what is this? Uh, RA250V1902. So the 1902, I believe the V1902 is your Kubota diesel number. Um, and so I do know it has a Kubota diesel. A couple clips here. Pull this up. And there's our Kubota diesel. So we've got looks like a little temp gauge there. I mean, it's dirty. It's been sitting for quite some time. Is that a fuel pump? Fuel coming in here. Oh, they've got the... So that's probably a... Yeah, that is. That's a fuel shutoff solenoid that is bypassed. So fuel comes from the fuel pump directly into the injection pump. So the fuel shutoff solenoid is not operating. But you can manually shut it off here by pulling this back. It's dirty. It's been sitting. And I know nothing more about it than that. Around this side, you can see, I mean, the roots growing through it. I had to cut those out to get it out. The exhaust. If you look at that, it has been just booger welded. And then they shoved some other pipe in there and then tried to get that to hold. So I'll show you the exhaust manifold. So this is one thing that I did do. I, I found this rubber plug. Let me get a light. So yeah, there's the exhaust manifold. It's broken. And I found this rubber plug and this whatever, and I shoved it in there just to try and keep any water out. But it snapped off right, right there, flush. And then all this was just braze or whatever they used to try and get it put back together. So long run, it needs an exhaust manifold. But yeah, it's it's been sitting a minute. Probably has a few probably has a few wasp nests. I'm gonna stick this back in here, trying to keep any dirt out, but yeah, all in all, there's our little baby diesel. Well, we do have a gauge. I didn't know we had an hour meter. So 2,469 hours. Those leads look sketchy as all get out. Oh, that one's not even connected. There's nothing in that hole. So they've just got them dangled. Ooh, straight out of the motor. Straight out of the actual electric generator there. <laughs> That's not sketchy. There you go for all your ether fans. There's the sticker you love. Let's check for fuel. Ooh, that does not look good. Yeah, it's crusty down there. No idea, we'll probably have to take that tank off and clean it, you know, put something metal in there and shake it or put it on a tire. But we're gonna bypass that probably first off. So yeah, that's kind of a walk around. You've got your, your current selector for major and then your fine adjustment there. You have start or up for preheat for your glow plugs. And then in here, it looks like it's missing a little gauge, but what, what's in there is there's a little coil, like a little wire that when the glow plug circuit gets, uh, I guess it goes up, when glow plug circuit gets electricity, it bypass or it passes through this wire and heads towards the actual glow plugs and supplies power to them. Well, in the process, this wire heats up. And so when you look through this little hole, you'll literally see it turn like bright orange. Um, and that's how you know that the glow plugs are working. If that does not turn orange, either the that's broken, blown out, or the glow plug circuit is not operating the way it should. So we do have one single uh, 120 volt outlet here, 
And then this is your fuel shutoff. You can manually do it there. Um, guessing that's some kind of fuse, maybe a fuse there, fuse there. Amp gauge, it, inside of it is just full of white powder. I'm not sure if that's gonna work. Very simple machine. Essentially, the engine turns the generator motor itself and that generates the electricity that then sends power out to these two leads here for your ground and there for your positive. And that is literally how you hook welding leads to it and then run it out to a stick welder and, and weld with it. I do not have any leads for this um, that came with it. I'm gonna have to dig some up. I've got some, I think, at, at the other shop. But for now, all we care about is, you know, does the engine run? Does the generator turn? Is everything free? And then will it generate power? And we're going to do it in that order. We're going to start with the engine. If it won't run, obviously we can't turn the generator. If we can't turn the generator, we can't weld. So let's start diving in. One thing that I did notice is this whole cover here. It's like put together somebody ran sheet metal screws right there there's another one so instead of bolt bolting this thing on properly they just threw it on top and sheet metal screwed it yep there's one here one there so my thought is let's take off this entire top and then that way we can see around the entire engine and around the entire generator and and start to get an idea of what we're looking at and maybe get a vacuum out, clean up some of the the debris, the, the webs, and and then we'll start figuring out what we need to do to get the engine running. There's our battery. Wonder if these battery terminals just pry off. Knowing Mike, they were never tight. Who am I kidding? Some of mine are that way too. Yep, that one's off. That one broke actually. No, it's not broken yet, but yeah. Loose. All right, we're gonna pull this battery out and we're gonna see if it's got a date code anywhere. I don't know how long this machine has been sitting. I wouldn't doubt it's 20 plus years. I don't know. All right. 2013. So that is 11 years. Less than I thought, but and you can see all these broken bolts for all the covers, which is why they went to just sheet metal screws. Broken, broken, broken. I'm gonna get this vine out of the radiator. You know what, I might just pull that whole radiator housing off. We can see a lot more. I hope that tank is good. There's another wasp nest. There we have our little Kubota diesel. Let's see if the engine wants to turn over. Well, the engine's not seized. I mean, you can't see it, but I can see it turning. Pushing on the belt, turning the fan. And the, the uh, alternator is also not seized, so that's great. No, I'm going to get a vacuum. I want to suck all this out of here.
radiator actually looks really good. There's no like discoloration where it's been leaking. There's no holes or some dings in the fins, but none in the tubes. No patches that I see. The neck is actually bent a little bit and yeah, that's probably a terrible idea to try and straighten that right now. Let's check oil. Now we've got a lot and grab a rag. All right, so that's the high mark. And we're literally right above that little oval shape. I'll show you. So actually we're kind of, yeah, we're right at that mark. I think we're good on oil. I mean, it's black, but it's to be expected. Get this air cleaner out of the way. Well, it comes off these two straps. And this should lift off. I guess it's disconnected there. Huh. We'll dig into this later. All right, there is a mess of fuel line here. And I gotta figure it out. So... The line to this filter here, it's cut, it's cut there, and it's cut here. So that filter has been, oh, oh my, that's packed with junk. That's, that's our main supply line right there. So filter has been bypassed. Let's just cut a little of the excess off. We're going to reuse this filter. We're going to plumb it back in at some point. Got some junk in there. Get the vacuum and suck that out. So this fuel line here goes into the pump. It's blocked with dirt here, but it could be just because it was in the dirt. Let's, let's cut off a little bit of it. Actually pretty clean right there. Then we have this fuel line that jumps over and bypasses the shutoff solenoid and goes into the injection pump. It looks crusty as all get out. So we're going to want to replace that line. And then over here, we've got this line. And this line, I think, if I'm looking at it, yep. So this line used to go from the tank the fuel pump. Well, I'm not going to reuse this. And I'm betting the fuel is shut off here. Let's just take, I'm just going to cut this so it's just kind of dangling so I remember it. I might be able to reuse a piece of this just for now. Let's cut it about. I'm not even sure why this has a shutoff solenoid for the fuel because you don't turn this thing on with a key. So I don't know why it even has that. I might have another one. For now, I'm going to leave it alone though. That line is, oh man, so bad. See all that corrosion right there? And right here. So 
I don't even know why I'm messing with fuel right now. I'm just trying to figure out where all the lines went to. So we don't even know how good the pump, this little pump is. We don't even know about our fuel situation. I'm going to loosen, try and slide that out of the way a little bit. So if and when we get it running, that's way too long. And really, it ought to go to a uh, shut-off solenoid, or I'll bypass that. But for now, we'll leave it like this. We're not going to hook this line to anything because we just want to start with figuring out if it'll crank over. If the starter's any good. We're going to get a good battery. And then we'll hook up a temporary fuel system. So right here we've got a temperature gauge. And this is the sensor. A wire that goes to the actual coolant water neck over there and tells us our water temp. Behind it, there's this plug here and this empty one there. I almost guarantee they go together. Don't know why they were disconnected. There's a reason. But I think for right this second, I'm just going to hook them up and then uh, we'll deal with it later might have something to do actually it does with that electric shutoff solenoid so maybe a, that's power shutting off power to it probably you know let's just get that out of the way okay you know what we're gonna leave that disconnected for now we're just gonna I put it right there, completely out of the way. I'm finding a lot of this like red flaking paint almost has me wondering if this is a different motor than what was originally in it. Right here it says 1861 CC. I haven't actually found anything on the motor that says this is a V1902. Mike told me it was a 2203 Kubota, um, which is what I have in the Skid Sierra that I got from him, and I've got a couple other machines with him in it. I'm just looking at the top of the motor here, and right on the top of the head, right there, there's a key. Yeah. Yeah, got an old master key. Looks like it's been sitting there a long time. I know these keys, they're for padlocks and the padlocks are junk. So somebody who's hiding this key to protect a padlock somewhere, you didn't even need the key to get in. Half the time with the locks that these do, you can just yank them or hit them with a hammer. But I don't know if it was accidentally dropped or hidden. With Mike, you never really know. All right, we've got the jumper pack on the leads. Let's see if we get any crank. We do. <laughs> I was not expecting that. Wow. Well, maybe Mike's right. Maybe we'll run. A little gallopy. Which could be a cylinder down. It's already smoking. Huh. Well, maybe our injection pump is uh, gonna be good. I'm gonna try this preheat. I can crank it. <laughs> Are you kidding me? I am absolutely pumped. It didn't even have fuel hooked up to it. And I don't even know if the glow plugs work because I didn't see anything. So let's, let's try it again. 
give it a little more glow plug. <laughs> it's probably out of fuel now. Huh. Sweet. Well, I'm gonna get a get some fuel set up, and we're gonna try and get this baby running. Well, we're gonna find out pretty quick if this uh, little fuel pump's any good. I think we'll pull this line off here. And we'll crank it over and we'll see if we're getting fuel out of, out of this little pump. And if we are, we'll keep going. And then we're going to need to get the nut to crack these nuts, which is the same for the injector lines. And then, so it should be just governed at a certain RPM. It should, I don't know if it has a high idle. I don't think so. Um, I think it is just one speed all the time, from what I can tell. And then up here, there's this like lever with a spring on it. I think it might have a decompression valve in the actual valve cover um, to make it easier to start or something. I'm not sure, but we're not gonna mess with that right now. I did check coolant. I can't see anything and I don't even see any moisture, so. Actually, there's a valve right here. Nothing so far. Oh, there's, yeah, we got a little coolant. All right, so there's some in there. I doubt it's full, but I really don't know. But the fact that we saw some. All right, good. I don't have to put any of that in there. One thing I'm gonna add into this diesel, we're gonna add a quart into this five gallon bucket. It's probably way too much, but this is a transmission fluid, automatic transmission fluid. And what it's gonna do, hopefully, is it'll mix with the diesel. And then as it's, Going through the injection pump, the injector is going to start clearing up all the debris, all of the old diesel that's been sitting in there for so long. So, so this line coming out of the fuel pump here is going into this little container. So. We've got the fuel supply coming into the fuel pump and then coming out into this container. We're going to see if this thing's pumping. If it's pumping, we'll rehook it back up and we'll start working our way through the fuel system. So you watch right there to see if fluid goes into that container. There we go. So we've got not a single drop. So what I could do is I could take that apart, try and figure it out, see what's going on, or we can just bypass that and go ahead and add a clicky clack. I'm kind of leaning toward doing that. More than likely, this thing's gonna need, it's probably a diaphragm pump. I'm pretty sure that those, that's what those are. Um, and the rubber could be bad. I don't know what's going on with it. So let's just, let's just skip that part. If you haven't seen these, these are pliers, needle nose pliers that grab hoses really, really well. And so you can grab a hose and you can pull it off or push one on like, like I just did here. So yeah, very useful. I wasn't able to get that by hand with the right tool. And you can get them cheap, Harbor Freight, online. They don't have to be nice. I don't use mine enough, so I bought some from Harbor Freight. All right, I redirected the 
the return line into this little container so we can see what it looks like. Still got that one off of the fuel pump, even though I don't think it's going to be doing anything. This last one. There, that one loosened. Put a little lube on those. All right, this fuel pump. There we go, our clicky clack. All right, we're ready to start it. Clicky clack's going. It's already sending it over the overflow. Let's try it. Got fuel on two of them. Yeah. Our overflow is actually filling up pretty quick. Fuel on three and four. That's a great, great sign. Really happy to see that because that means that our injection pump is doing injection pump things. So the color you see of the fuel, it looks like old diesel, but it's because of that ATF we added. got fuel on one and on two. Nice. I was fully expecting to have to dive into that injection pump. But I don't think that's the case this time. Wow. It's crazy for all the junk I work on. All the old machines have been forgotten. I'm going to blow off the fuel around the injectors. A lot of times I'll do that in order to make it so that if there's a leak, I can see the leak better than leaving that fuel that's there. All right, we are looking good. I think what I'm gonna do, take this return line, I need to get a bigger jug. So that's what we've gotten out of it so far. And it's got some dirt in it, so it's actually probably a good thing I did that. 12 volts on. All right, here goes nothing. Yeah! Would you look at that? It fired right up. And, let me shut this off. And, the shutdown works. Beautiful. I am pumped. So something's going on with right here. Give me that line. Um, I don't know, we're gonna start it back up. All right, start it back. Preheat.
Beautiful. Sweet. She's a runner. So I want to stop wasting the the fuel getting sent back in the return line. So now I'll go back to the tank. So it's a bit smoky in here. I'm going to open up the door a little bit, get some air in here. And then really the plan, I think next, I want to start diving into the, the fuel filter. I'm going to try and find an oil filter for it. We'll do an oil change. We'll do a filter change for the, for the fuel filter and get that hooked up. We'll figure out if this uh, temp gauge is working. And maybe before I do all that, just start it back up and just see if it's got any output. And if it's, because I don't know, just because Mike said, oh, it wasn't making power for, for welding doesn't mean it's not. Uh, it just means that that's what he remembers. So, and then I want to figure out, get the air filter back on, get all the filters changed, new fuel lines, We'll have to dive into this fuel pump. I want to get the actual factory one fixed rather than continuing to use the clicky clack. That's fine for now. When I go to do start and stuff like this, I, I'm fine retrofitting something for the moment, but I'd much rather it work the way it was designed. So if we need to get a fuel pump or a rebuild kit, if we need to get, you know, I'm not sure what this shutoff solenoid is even there for. Um, because there's no on and off with it, there's no switch, unless maybe it gets hooked to some sort of a breaker that pops and then it shuts off fuel. That could be. We'll have to chase the wiring. Got to dive into the tank. There's a lot we got to do. Let's start. I'm going to open the door, get some, some fresh air in here, even though it's extremely cold out. And then we're going to start it back up and see if we've got power. If we've got power coming out of the generator, we just have to start whittling away at the little things that need to get done to make it look and work the way it should. Awesome step in the recovery of this old beast is that it started, it runs. It actually runs really good. It sounds good. It idles down. Even though this thing is a set RPM all the time, this lever here, if I pull back on it, it basically adjusts how much fuel the injection pump is sending out to the injectors essentially bringing the RPMs down lower. And so by messing with this, I can bring it to an idle, even though this machine is set to run at that RPM all the time, because that's just the way they are. Generators are, are just built that way. And they tend to last a long time because they don't have all of the revving up, up and down with the RPMs. And that's a lot harder on an engine than one fixed speed. Um, but, yeah, let's get some air in here, and we'll see if it's making any power. I'm gonna let it run for a little while out here, but it doesn't smoke up the shop. All right, I'm going to let it run outside for a while. It's really smoking up the shop in here. And it's kind of hard because I can't really open the doors too much or I lose a lot of heat. So I think what I'm going to do tomorrow, I'm going to bring, I've got a, a welding fume extractor. It's huge, big square. It's probably, I don't know, three feet by three feet by maybe four feet tall with an arm. And so it's got a big filter in it should be able to bring that down here and then just stick it right over the top of the uh, the exhaust and that should cut down on a lot of the fumes i might even plumb some sort of a pipe i really want to set up some sort of a fume extractor to just kick all the fumes right outside don't have that now tomorrow i'm definitely going to bring that but for now let's let it warm up outside and then we'll keep messing with it
This thing runs amazingly well, the engine. I don't know if we're generating power, but it's staying cool. The thermostat seems to be working. It's going about 189, 190, which tells me it's probably got 190 degree thermostat. I added a little bit of coolant to the tank. So I probably had a quarter of a gallon. I poured it in there and it filled up to the top of the tank, right at the bottom of that, that uh, fill neck, which is, tells me it was already pretty much full anyway, which is great. It's smooth. It, all of the uh, cylinders on the exhaust ports, same temperature. So we don't have a cylinder that's down. It sounds great. I ran it for probably, I don't know, 35, 40 minutes outside. Right now it's about negative two because the temperature is dropping, but I wanted it to get warm. I wanted that, that oil to really get through and everything. And so I think what we're gonna do right now, since it is warm, and we're gonna dump the oil and get a new filter for it. Might as well do it right this second. I've got a bunch of filters. We should be able to find a filter that fits this thing. So let's do that now. And then tomorrow, I'm going to bring that well, that uh, fume extractor, and we're going to start it up in here and see if we get it to generate for us. There we go. I wondered where it said Kubota V1902. So now we do know this is the original engine. moving the, it over because the drain plug for the engine is like right there. So there are absolutely no numbers on this filter at all. I already looked. So I'm not going to worry too much about caring about it. Looks like it's never been changed. All right, let's take this in the other room and see if we can find a filter that'll fit. All right. Got some filters, brand new in the boxes there. And we got all these filters here. These are all oil. Or what? It's too big. Too big. That's the right hole size. Looks like the rubber and that one is about right, about the same diameter. And I can't quite tell, but it looks like the threads are right, so that's an option. We'll take that. Here's a deeper one. That is maybe the right hole size, but the O-ring is too big. What number is that? 2160. All right. That. Looks right. Small, medium, and large here. So we either got too small or too big. We'll take them both out there, and if the longer one fits, it's got more filtration ability. I don't actually know if that matters. Can you run, if the filter's bigger, does it have more ability to filter more since there's more filter paper in there? There's more actual you know, it has more to catch, or does it just not matter? They get plugged. I understand that, you know, it should be changed regularly, but I'm just curious. So here's the bigger one. And obviously if I put it in there, it's gonna contact the outer shell of the machine, the cover. So that one is gonna be too big. This one will be fine. It's shorter than the previous filter, but that's okay. 
Let's just make sure it threads on. Threads on perfect. So it's difficult to pre-oil these, these uh, side filters when they're on like that. I'm just going to basically put it on there and we're going to let the engine fill the filter. Well, no metal particles in it. I don't see any metal swirls. I don't see any water. Although water is going to be at the bottom. But I didn't see any earlier. None came out when we took the plug out, just oil. So it's just black, which is great. That's an awesome, awesome sign. Leave that there. All right, got the oil changed, got it all filled back up. I am done for tonight. I'm gonna go home, hang out with my wife and kids, have some dinner, and I'll be on this just like that. So I was thinking about my welding fume extractor and trying to use it to make the exhaust smoke leave. Well, it has filters, and what that would do is it would filter out maybe like you know some of the particulates, but it's not gonna eliminate the CO2 and the other hydrocarbons that are created by an engine in a confined space like this. So that's probably not the best plan. So I came up with this idea. This is a dust collection system, portable dust collection system for construction usually. And I used to own a construction business and used to run it. We use this a lot for like, you know, drywall dust or if we're using saws in a house to try and take care of all the dust and get it out of the house so we don't end up with a layer of dust on everything and it has this tube a bag it's got that little chute thing right there but what it is essentially is just a big fan and so there's a block off so you can shut these off it's a an old delta portable dust collector but it's a big fan in there that sucks from one of them and blows out the other one. I think it sucks in through this one and blows out this way. So these tubes here, these three, two small chunks and then this little bit of longer one, you can stick this over the end of an exhaust pipe and you would have a hole like in the garage door or in the wall. And you stick that in there and then the exhaust can go out. Well, when we redid this shop, the garage doors had those holes right in the middle of each, all three of them. These doors don't. And so... I don't really want to poke holes in the doors. They're insulated, they're expensive doors. Maybe we'll do it eventually through here. But right now I need a bigger, uh, basically the bottom seal below this garage door. So I've got a bunch of you know, rag towels just stuffed under the door. So what I think I'm gonna do is I'm gonna run one of those tubes under there and that will be how we get the exhaust out for now. Eventually I wanna build some sort of a a general vacuum air, you know, like something up in the corner maybe that sucks all of the air out because smoke and heat rises and then it can easily pull it back out. For today, I don't want to deal with that. I don't want to mess with, you know, trying to come up with something permanent. My thought is this tube is probably, it's all plastic. It's probably too meltable, I guess I could say. So I came up with these. I went to the local hydraulic repair shop a while back and I was getting some hydraulic hoses made and these hoses, as well as a bunch of others, they were getting rid of. They were, they were basically transitioning from being a Parker dealer to another company and they had a whole bin full of hydraulic hoses and in it were these. I think will work perfectly in this. This is not gonna be permanent. This is literally just me kind of trying to find a quick way to solve the issue of, I wanna run this in this building and I don't wanna lose all my heat. I, it's really, really cold outside. It'd be better to be in here and be able to work on it. I, to be able to work on the actual generator portion and know what's happening, test on it, I need the engine running.
There. Now we can put the big hose on the suction side. Let's actually just make sure I'm right before we go too far. We'll plug it in and turn it on. All right, turn this on. Yep, it's blowing out that way. Sucking in that way. The other nice thing is this thing is 110, so I can plug it into any outlet. I don't have to worry about, you know, needing 220 or even, I've got a few of these bigger ones that are uh, three phase. And yeah, this will work great for this. Here's kind of what I'm thinking. We have flexible one here, one way over there, this pipe. Connect that this. Think it's something like that. Then it'll be easy to take it apart, move it on to the next project. I'd like to get, you know, some sort of an arm or figure out a better system than this, but for a quick, literally cost me nothing, I think this ought to do what I need. I'm gonna dive into this little fuel pump just real quick. I wanna see if, if it looks bad in there or if maybe we can revive it. Get rid of the electric one. I sprayed some WD-40 down this tube. There we go. Something dripping, might be the WD-40. All right, door number one. We got some buildup in there. I didn't tear the gasket, but I'm gonna clean that out. See if we can get the other side off. Trying not to ruin these gaskets. Here's the other side. And this is our diaphragm that does the pumping. I didn't realize there was... You get oil on this side. So there must be oil that lubricates the shaft that goes in and out so as this thing is going like the engine is moving and this thing goes like this and then that's what pulls the fuel all right got this much cleaner that diaphragm still seems rubbery so we're just going to put it back together actually it's going to go like this I'm going to snug them up with this, then I'm going to get a screwdriver and do the rest by hand. All right, I want to bring this fuel filter back into the system. It was bypassed, so let's pull it. There we go. That is some nasty looking fuel. 
So this is a Wix 33395, and I got an exact filter to replace it. There we go. That's our supply to the fuel pump. And then I got to get another line. This line right back here is the supply coming from the tank. So we'll just come out of this tank. Way too much. It happens. everything all set up. The only thing I don't have on right now is the air cleaner. I'm not too worried about that short term. Let's see if we can get fuel out of this pump into the injection pump. The lines are dry. We've got fuel in the filter, so we'll find out. Just on 12 volts. And then it should be good to crank. Yep, we're getting smoke. Let me show you. I'll show you how this uh, exhaust is going to work. There's our broken exhaust manifold, but the exhaust comes out there. Watch. <laughs> now, I'm going to turn it on. Now we'll crank. Watch right there, right in that area. Right here. Some of the smoke is exiting right here. I gotta seal that up better. Now we'll try it. Right here we have, it basically it's a bleeder valve and there should be a little knob on it. It should look like this. So this is a replacement one. You can crack this open and it should allow you to bleed the air out of the system there. Well, it's uh, broken. So we're gonna throw this one in there. I have a couple other Kubota diesels that are V2203s and a lot of the parts are very similar, if not identical. A lot of times when I take off these hoses, if I'm going to reuse it, which temporarily we are, and if it works, we're going to leave it forever, I'll cut the end off because the end of it is kind of flared. It's, it's basically been sitting there, and it's safer to just use a, a new tiny little section of the hose because you can typically get a better, better fit. It'll be tighter than it was before. Sometimes that creates its own problems of not wanting to go on, but we can deal with that.
So I've got the electric clicky clack disconnected to power. The way I have it set up is fuel goes from the tank to the clicky clack, from the clicky clack electric pump to filter housing, through the filter housing up to the mechanical fuel pump. From the mechanical fuel pump, it feeds it into the injection pump. And so because we've been running it, literally pushing fluid from behind this fuel pump all the way through the filter and back into this mechanical pump and having cleaned it out and really didn't see any major issues, we might have brought life back to it basically by, you know, the fluid has to go through that pump. So it's going to clean it. It's going to re rejuvenate it, hopefully, quote unquote. But let's try it without that electric clicky clack on at all. I did disconnect it while it was still running and it seemed to be fine. So um, let's see if it'll start without it. Put this back here. We've got this here because this line here is the return line from the injectors and I want it dumping back into this tank. Obviously, one of the issues we're having here is we're not getting electricity out of this, out of the actual generator side of the machine. Now, I was looking in here when it was running. I couldn't see anything moving. So we're going to take this cover off and see if we can find anything obvious. Well, something is definitely up because this thing should be spinning. Huh, I'm turning the engine over doing this. I thought maybe there was like a, a Woodruff key or some sort of a Lovejoy connection in there that was broken, but I don't think that's the case. Let's start this up and just see what happens. Well, it spins. I was wrong. I don't know if that's a good or a bad thing. Obviously, something simple would be, a, you know, a key is destroyed and you got to replace it. But that could also cause a heck of a lot more damage. So I am glad the whole thing is coupled together. Now we just got to start digging into what could be causing this to not create electricity. Oh my. Wow, there is a massive nest in here. There's some of it. Sure, being dirty in here is not helping anything. Yeah, this is a, definitely a Lincoln generator for sure. The brushes say Lincoln T2687. I'm gonna get a vacuum in here and get all this cleaned out. There, that gives us a lot more access to try and work on all these nasty looking wires. We've got stuff that's not connected. We've got stuff that's cut. We've got stuff that's supposed to go somewhere, but it's not. So yeah, I'm gonna have to figure all this out. I gotta get a wiring diagram and try and figure out what's going on here. Even the, the crusty connections here could be corroded and just not allowing the flow of power the flow of power.
All right, obviously I want to get clean air into that diesel, so let's let's clean the air cleaner. All right, let's see what the filter looks like. It doesn't look too bad from this perspective. I can see dirt in the filter though. Is it just this one? No pre-filter, just that filter. Yeah, it's definitely in need of changing. So I got a new one. This is a Donaldson filter. I got the comparable wicks. Let's finish getting this cleaned out. And actually I see some rust kind of like in here. See the rust like right, right there, all the way on there. I think I'm gonna take a wire brush and get it as clean as I can. And then we might spray paint that. I don't want little particles getting brought through the filter mechanism because that's after the filter. The filter goes over that and any of that rust is going to just get sucked into the engine unfiltered. So let's finish this thing up. We get these elbows cleaned. I'm probably going to replace the, the band clamps with some actual hose clamps. I'm not going to make you watch me clean everything. So I'll bring you back when we're a little closer to putting it back together. All right, so I'm kind of diving into the wiring here and just kind of looking for issues. First issue I see is this wire here, I tied them together like that. And I can tell that at one time there was a scotch lock. That's what these are. See that blue thing there? That's a scotch lock. If you're going to do wiring, don't use these. They're junk. So. I'll have to replace that one, but I can tell there's a scotch lock here because that's the inside of the scotch lock. What it does is basically when you close that little connector together, it pierces both wires with this little metal thing here. And that little metal thing leaves a mark on the wire that looks like this. Essentially, you can see how it's like pierced through the coating right by my finger here and so of all the wires that are disconnected the only ones that look like they are going together are these ones and so somebody whoever did this instead of continuing with a white wire they used a chunk of green i will be replacing that so i want the wiring to be the same as the wiring diagram i have here because it's important for me to be able to follow wires so what is this white wire? I've been following it back and it looks like it leads back here and is one of the wires comes out right here and goes to the water temp gauge. So then from there, there's a red wire that jumps up back and goes over to the hour meter. The hour meter is not working and the temperature gauge isn't working. And I'm wondering if it's because this wire is not connected to this green one. So we're gonna, we're gonna put those together real quick. I don't know where this wire goes. This one's not connected to anything. I'm not sure where that guy goes. Um, there's a fuse, an inline fuse right here. And this yellow wire on the other side of it. So this yellow wire comes down and goes into the wiring loom that goes down into this alternator. Basically, this is the, the start. It gives it the voltage, the initial voltage, to be able to start and start generating electricity on the actual larger uh, generator side. It could be as simple as maybe that fuse is bad. Mm, you see all these connections here? These are for adjusting the voltage to different ranges. There's green residue all over that. I need to clean all that. I did wire brush this rheostat here. Essentially, this is 
it allows you to variably change the voltage as that thing spins. The other side of the dial basically is our fine adjustment from 10 to 100. And so as you're spinning that, behind the scenes what's happening is this little arm is moving to a different side of that coil. And I don't know all the technical terms for it, exactly how it works, but I do know that the voltage varies based on the location on this here. So essentially, at one place you get very little, and on the other side you get the exact opposite with a lot. So I've got the meter. Let's test. Let's start by testing that fuse. Um, fuses are something that could pop easily. So you want to put your multimeter on continuity. You take your two leads, and I always do this before you do anything. You take them and you touch them together. That beep and that solid sound says, we have a connection. We have a connection. That's all it's doing. It's testing if there is a connection out this wire, out the red wire, and all the way back through the, the, the black one. That way you know, if I test two sides of a wire, and you can do this with anything. So let's, let's uh, anything that's a connection electrically, we'll test this side of the wire to this side of the wire. And we have continuity through this little green wire. I figured we would. Now to do it on the fuse, we'll take the red on one side. I know you can't see the fuse real well, it's right there. Black on one side, red on the other. And actually, we're not getting, or maybe we are. Maybe that fuse is good. It's, it's not a great signal, so I'm betting the contacts in that are dirty. Let's pull that fuse out. All right, I cleaned up the fuse, the two ends. Now we'll test it for continuity. Yep. All the way around it. So it was dirty and just wasn't making great contact. And I cleaned up the fuse holder in there with a wire brush. I'm going to pop this in there for now. So now we can take and put a test lead on the two wires on the outside. Wire on the outside, wire on the outside. Good deal. All right, so that's fixed. All right, so the manual says that we might have lost the excitation in the field for the actual um, machine here, and that's what basically gives it the ability to start generating power. So let's try it. Negative. Positive. I don't know how long we're supposed to do this. The other thing is, is like all of these contacts that I'm finding throughout this whole machine, all the electrical stuff, it's rusted or it's corroded. And so I'm probably, if this doesn't work, going to start going through every single connection and cleaning them and putting them back together. All right. Well, let's, uh, let's try starting it. I'm still not getting any power at all. So no voltage is coming out of the, the outlet or the leads. So I think it's time to start cleaning. All right, so I'm working my way through the electrical system and I verified that the hour meter does work, but it was not working. So the way I did that was we've got a pair of jumpers on both the leads and then I take that and I just go right to a, right to a battery. So we'll put one positive there or negative there, I mean, and positive here. And you can see, so that's 2,470 hours and zero tenths. And then the little one on the far side, it just goes one, zero, one, zero. And basically, I think that's like the every other second kind of thing. I'm not sure what they call that, but I now know that this this hour meter is functional and works. We just have to get it working. So next, I worked my way over to the oil pressure switch. 
and this is normally open and I figured that out by googling the part number M-4006 which means that to test it we need to put pressure to it it closes at 4 psi so barely any pressure at all um, it goes right here right above the the starter the starter went right here to get this out without destroying it I had to remove the starter which is just two bolts not too hard so I'll show you how to test a normally open oil pressure switch all right to test this switch we need a multimeter and you set it to continuity which is this one right there and with continuity basically it's like creating a circuit when you hear the beep that means that the circuit is completed I always do that I test all my multimeters every time just to verify that the problem is not going to be with the meter so if I touch one of these to each side of this this is a two wire which just means that it has two leads that go to it there are some that only have one wire and it gets the ground through the actual body of it so to test those you just touch the body and you test touch the other side to what the single lead but this one has two so you test one here and one here and you might if you're if you don't know whether it's open or not you might think okay this is bad well I figured out that it is not normally closed normally closed means the circuit is complete meaning that there should be power allowed to go all the way through normally open means that in order for the circuit to be completed it has to close it's kind of the backwards way of uh, thinking it but if you understand electronics and the way that things are wired it makes perfect sense so in figuring out this is normally open what we need to do what we'll do is we'll take and we'll connect one lead to this side and the other lead to that side and then what we can do and I didn't do anything complicated here it's literally just a air pressure watch the screen the circuit closes and then we can go to ohms and we can test the resistance and I'm not sure what this is supposed to be rated at I need I should look that up but um, this will tell us the resistance within this switch And it probably matters how much pressure is being put to this. I don't exactly know if that's true or not, but because we're getting some different readings here. And this is this is way higher pressure. This is coming out at 100 and 120, maybe 100 psi. I'm not sure what I've got it set to, but it's way more than the four this needs. But we've established that this is a good oil pressure switch. And so I cleaned it all up. I got new screws for this end wire brushed the heck out of it got all the dirt and corrosion off and that's what I'm doing is I'm going through all these I did find that one of the leads there was this little black lead right here the wire basically broke off the connector so I crimped a new connector on that for now so I'm going to put this back in and I'm going to keep working my way through every little thing and try and solve all of the electrical problems basically I'm going through cleaning all the contacts replacing the ones that are bad and trying to find issues testing sensors so i've been doing a deep dive into the wiring here and i've uh basically started you know cleaning the wires and labeling them figuring out i put a new um amp meter in this one had only goes up to 30 the other one went up to 40 not really sure i think that amp meter is literally only for the alternator um, i also wired the glow plug indicator back in they had it cut completely out. So what'll happen is in this hole, there's a little wire that will glow and it'll indicate that you're actually getting power to your glow plugs. Um, I was doing some cleaning, basically cleaning. So right here is the exciter. And so I'm basically just cleaning every connection on the actual, uh, pulling the bolts off, sanding any rust off, getting all the corrosion out of there, and then taking and testing for continuity um, so I'll touch one end of a wire here and then I'll go back up to where I know another wires at 
and then that tells me that this wire here that I'm testing is good. All right, let's, uh, let's test this thing out. I've been through all the wires, every single connection that's made in this panel, on the engine. The only ones I haven't been into is the actual generator itself. There's a few that have been through all this panel here. So we're gonna find out. Um, it should fire right up with a little glow plug and see if we make making power. All right, lung protector. Our glow plug indicator works now. Awesome, and the amp gauge is working. Here we go. All right, so we fixed a few things. This amp gauge does work, but it kept like going eh, 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 not sure why. The hour meter absolutely works. And now when we shut it off, it stops working, which is perfect, that's what we want. And the alternator started working. So it's charging, you saw 15 point something volts. So the alternator now works. Hour meter works. I don't know if our uh, water temp gauge it does look like it moved a little. I only ran it probably five or 10 minutes. I wouldn't even say that. I'd probably say three or five minutes. Um, not getting any power out of the, the generator side yet. So I think what we're gonna do is we're gonna try and flash. We're gonna try and re-excite the, uh, the exciter the same way we did with the other time with the battery and we'll just see what happens. So I don't exactly know how long to do this, but going to do it the same way. The rearmost um, brush holder is the negative. That definitely did more of something than it ever did before. And let's try and start it again. Our uh, suction back on. nothing. Let me try it again. I don't know, so I think there's something else going on. I got a few more things to check, but for tonight, we got a few things cleaned. We got the alternator working. We got the hour meter working. I don't know if the temp gauge is working or not, but I'd go ahead and call that some wins for today. Hopefully we can figure it out. <laughs> I'm sure I will. It's just going to be a matter of how long it's going to take me and how many tries I'm going to have to figure it out. But Big win with the alternator, big win with the hour meter. Still have a handful of wires. I don't know what they go to. The wiring diagram isn't the greatest, but yeah, awesome. So while I was cleaning this out, getting the rust painted, I went ahead and just threw a coat of black on the actual entire filter housing. Look a little nicer. Here's our old filter. We've got a brand new Wix. One thing that's important to know about these style filters 
is if they have a hole in the end like this, make sure you get a new washer. Now, I bought one of these and the parts store basically sent it to me and it was like this, it wasn't there, just the sticker was here. And I went back to the store and I was like, it's missing the washer. Well, this washer here is the old one, it was on here. They couldn't find one and they were basically like, well, why don't you just use the old washer? Well, two reasons. One, it's not what I paid for. I paid for a brand new part. I want the parts that come with it. Two, this rubber deteriorates over time and it gets harder. And the problem with that is, it's not that I couldn't use that washer. It probably is still good. The problem is, is that this is a hole. If any air, unfiltered air or dirt and debris goes past that hole, it is basically bypassing the filter and going right into the engine. It is very important that this hole is sealed so that no air can go there through there and all the air has to go through the filter paper and then into the engine. So make sure that you find the little washer if you have to bolt your uh, air filter into the hill filter housing like on this one. So just a quick note, Let's toss this in and then we'll have uh, filtered air. Perfect. All right, so I got to poking around down here and I'm looking at this right there. And I actually, the more I look at it, I think that might be a diode. And when I cleaned it up, the wire was attached below down here. So I crimped on a new end and I basically used this as a nut. But I'll show you, power will only go one way through that. And that's essentially what a diode does. It allows power to go in one direction, but not back the other way. And so there was a wire at one time soldered on right there. You can see the the remnants of it. So I'm thinking that this wire coming from the actual brush here on the alternator side of this welder generator is on the wrong side here and not getting power to generate or excite this side of the generator. So let's, let's pull that off and flip it around. Okay, so this is the diode, and the more I look at it, I can kind of see the epoxy right in there around the edge. Normally there'd be some numbers. I'm going to clean this up and see if there's any numbers, but I'll show you on the meter. What you do is you put it on here, and your diode mode is that little, like, uh, arrow with a stick through it. So then to get that, I push this over here, and now we got diode mode. And what that does is essentially, I'm pretty sure that the red is always the powered side, or basically where power is coming through. So if I take this, let me move this up so you can see the screen a little better. Okay, so if I take this and I put one end here and one end on the other side, in one of these modes I should get no nothing. So that no power is flowing from this stick up to this. So now, if I take and I put this down here, you can see we're getting a reading. So power is flowing from this down through to the stud, but it's not allowed to flow back up and back into the alternator, basically the, this, the brushes on the front. And that's what you want. And maybe that's our whole, it, well, I don't know if it's our whole issue. I say that a lot. Um, that is an issue. So that, in that way, we get, it works. We flip it. It also works, meaning it's operating right. So I am going to, we're going to remove this wire here. Probably just snip this end off. And we'll solder it right onto this stud there. And then we can install it and we'll give it a try.
Yeah, I think all the marks are gone. But what I did here, I took out the old wire and then I tinned it, which basically means you cover it with solder. And then that allows you to put the wire through and we'll do that on the machine. And then it's ready to basically put the new solder and we'll tin the wire and then we'll install it. This is flux. It will make the solder flow and go where I want. Beautiful. Solid connection. Now let's test it real quick. Rut row. Might have gotten a little hot. Okay, good. We cleaned it. Must have had some like flux or something because now power is not flowing back up into that wire. But power is flowing from that wire down through it. So I cleaned this up. I think that the rating for whatever the diode size is has been rusted away. So I don't know, we're gonna, we're gonna give this a shot first. If we end up needing to figure out what size diode that is, um, we'll look into it then. But for now, that's definitely a problem. And Hopefully, it does something good for us. I need to get one of these uh, diode rectifiers. Essentially, it's this square box with a bunch of wires on it. And then I need to get two new breakers. So these are circuit breakers. Both of them are junk, but they currently do work. I, I put power through them, and I'm getting power out of them. So they need to be replaced. But I did replace the outlet, put a brand new 20 amp outlet on it with some cap head screws instead of, um, instead of the flat heads that it never work later. Um, yeah, I'm just starting to kind of button some of this up and get it figured out. All right, so this is what's called a bridge rectifier or a bridge rectifier diode. And basically what it is, it is four diodes. A diode is an electrical device that allows power to go one way and not come back the other way. So a diode symbol is basically you have a line, there's an arrow, and a line. And so that symbol means that power can flow that way, but then that line denotes that it can't come back this way. And so this diode, or this uh, bridge rectifier, essentially is a square with four points on it. And the way this one is set up is that it basically goes arrow this way, the line, arrow this way, the line there, and then these go up here arrow heading that way. The line there. So the way it works is power can flow from this one to this pin and this pin to this pin, but not back to this one. And then it can flow from here to this one and from here to this one, but it can't flow from this one back to here or this one back to there. To test it, you put your meter, if it has a diode mode, you go to that. And what that does, is it basically emulates one side having power and the other one not. So we want, the red is our power. So we put the red, that's on our bottom, that's where power's coming in. And I should get a reading at both this one and this one. 
I do there, and I do there. And we'll test it. We'll put the power here, and we'll test it here. Should not get a reading. Okay, see how it doesn't beep? And then switch that to the other side. And we got nothing. So those two diodes are working correctly. Now we want power to come from this lug to that one. So if I take and I put this on the very top one, I should get a reading here. I do. And then if we switch them, I should get no reading here. Nothing. Now we'll go over to this other side. So I should have power coming from this to the top one. I do. But then if I flip them, I should have nothing coming back this way. Nothing. The only thing I am not sure on, and maybe you can tell me, is when I go across these two poles here, basically the positive up here and the negative. Or maybe not. I thought I was getting a reading earlier. No, I'm not. Okay. Maybe it's the other way. Yeah. Okay. That's our reading. So I'm not sure if this is right or not, but I get a reading coming from this positive or this negative up to the positive. And it's actually double the reading, basically the 0.5 ish of the other readings. And like I showed you, it doesn't reverse back down, but I'm not sure if that's correct or not for this setup. So if you have any ideas, definitely let me know. I'm curious. Um, I did order one of these and I cleaned it all up. It looked really bad. These, these basically, uh, terminals were all rusty and corroded. Um, they're getting really thin and really fragile. So I'm going to replace it either way, but I think it's good from what I know. And basically having it out of the system, since we're not hooked to any wires, I'm pretty sure this is operating the way it should be. So let's put that back in and we'll keep working our way through stuff and see if we can figure out what is really causing this thing not to not to make power. All right, let's talk about this thing. So far, we're not getting it to generate. And so I've done a lot off camera, basically just testing electrical components and trying to figure out cleaning every single connection. I mean, I took out every single wire, all of these and wire brushed them, cleaned them, replaced the ends if necessary. I replaced this little fuse holder right there. I happen to have one, so I threw that in there. There's a new outlet there. Um, and I'm starting to figure out kind of a lot of wires where they go because this thing was pretty chopped up by somebody. And for instance, this wire that goes down into the, the actual exciter alternator side of it, it, it was just taped up like this with wire. And so I still don't know what it is. What I do know, is I think this thing is missing the correct type of switch. So this switch basically gives you, you click it down to start or up for glow plugs. And then there's this other little uh, momentary switch here. And it did nothing, at least so I thought. Well, I think what that momentary switch was, was for right here, this is an electric solenoid for fuel. And I've cleaned it up, I've gone all the way through it, and I figured out, and I kind of found a good spot to mount it. I am going to put that back in, and the reason I am is because it's set up with two safety features. One, if the water temp gets too high, then it'll shut the engine off. And two, if the oil pressure gets too low, then it'll shut the engine off. And it does that electrically. Um, and so fuel goes in this pipe, and out another one and then through the fuel system. This thing was just floating when we first found it and it wasn't connected to anything. Neither was most of this fuel system. And so I would like to have those safeties. This fuel shutoff solenoid does work. And so if you listen, when I hit that momentary switch, that is the electric inside the solenoid 
opening and closing. So it's, it's normally closed. When I hit the button, it opens it, a lot, which would basically allow fuel. So a momentary switch here is only on when you push it. And I need it to be on all the time. So I need to replace that with another toggle switch, just a single pull on or off toggle switch. And that would allow me to basically turn on the fuel or shut off the fuel. Now, I'm still gonna wanna shut off the fuel mechanically. So if I shut it off electronically, the fuel injection pump is basically gonna have to run dry after this. And so it's gonna have to prime itself every single time. So really, I wanna shut it down mechanically and then shut off the solenoid itself. That way, fuel stays in the whole system. But for now, we don't have this hooked up. Electrically, we do. I've got it wired in, I've got it bolted in, but I've just got these little rubber caps over the fuel inlet and the fuel outlet. Um, so, so we've got that in there. I still have not figured out if this gauge works at all. I don't think it actually does, but it has two wires on the back of it. And what I think happens is that if this water temp gets over a certain temperature, it shuts off power to this solenoid, ki basically killing the engine. It would, again, like I said, it would have to run out of fuel that it's running on in the injection pump. And then once it's starved for fuel there, it'll die, um, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. Same with the oil pressure sensor, which is right over here. That will also, in theory, shut off um, power to this solenoid, essentially giving us a, a no fuel situation where it'll kill the engine that way. I did go through and I pulled all these brushes back. There are four sets of brushes on um, in there that these two here, right there, they were totally seized to the bottom there and they wouldn't move. So now I can, I can move them. You can see that gap opening up and so, yeah, I can move them now, and they're making good contact. Plug this back in. This outlet, if you're wondering, what you can do is you can unplug this. Basically, that would eliminate the rheostat, this fine control on the, on the dash here. And there are remotes that you can plug into there, and it gives you, like, you know, 100 feet of cord. And then it gives you that fine dial adjustment out where you're welding, um, which would be a nice thing to have. Obviously, I don't have it now, but um, it is one of those things. Maybe I'll, I'll take a look and try and find. I would like to get, you know, some sort of a wire wire uh, feeder for this to be able to make it so that I could run MIG wire through this. Another thing I did is I, I put a ground from the engine to the frame. The wire was already here. There was no end on this side, so I just I crimped on an end, soldered it together, drilled a hole, mounted it here, mounted it there. We still have the actual battery wire going out here to this battery. And right now I've got this little shutoff on the battery so I can disconnect when I'm working on it and I don't want power going through the system. But yeah, lots of cleaning, lots of basically tedious work. Um, the another thing that's happening is the hour meter, it's working. We got 2470 and 3 tenths of an hour. It works sometimes and then it doesn't work other times. And same with voltage from the alternator. It'll charge, I'll get it up to 14 volts, 14 and a half volts, and then for whatever reason it stops. And so I'm not sure if something's going on with this. It has this like weird little basically plug-in, you know, metal potted electronic thing that you can't fix. Um, and then this, this triple plug. So there could be an issue with this. This mult or this hour meter is wired through this pressure sensor and the alternator, so that could be a deal. I was having problems where the alternator would stop working because this fuse kept blowing right here, this little uh, little barrel fuse, and so I replaced that fuse holder, put a new fuse in it, and so far I haven't had that blow yet. So I'm not quite sure if that's the issue either. Um, as of this moment. In this new outlet, I'm, I'm put together this quick little uh, light bulb. And what that's gonna do for us is, right now we're not getting, I haven't yet been able to get voltage even to the, the 110 receptacle here to be able to you know, run any kind of accessory. So if we're not getting power here, we're not gonna get power here. 
And right here, these are the leads that come out of the out of the actual uh, generator that you would weld with. You, you know, one of them ideally would have been here and here, but these these little holders have melted. Um, and a lot of these wires, if you look at them, they're cracking. They're starting to fall apart. The copper is starting to be exposed. I have been in and I have checked the actual um, the stator windings. These two wires here, and I have run a meter across them and they are actually good and it's putting out like 43,000 um and i read that like 50 is brand new so yeah i say what we do right now is we just fire it up and we'll see if anything has changed um i also have uh a stone we're going to clean the actual um armature here try and get that all all looking better and cleaned up and it'll also help mate the brushes better to the actual armature as well and there's more that i'm going to do to it and i've kind of just been been doing as little as possible like even these wire nuts i know they're not right it's not the permanent fix i'm throwing two wires together quickly to be able to help me determine what else needs to be done with this thing so that we can we can move towards the solution that fixes it and once that's done we're gonna eliminate all that junk we're gonna put way better connections in there or run a brand new piece of wire or whatever we need to do to make it last that's the goal but initially when you're testing stuff you really have to focus on doing as simple as you can so that you can move through the system and try and figure out what the issues are rather than trying to fix every little thing and then come to find out you know it's completely grenaded inside and it's just completely useless it's not worth your time to spend any more effort on it um because you got to send it off and have it rewound or something like that and i i don't know if that's where we're headed but kind of wondering but let's go ahead and do that let's get it fired up we'll see what happens I've got this meter which is going to basically tell me the dc volts that this uh exciter basically has if it's putting out the most i've seen out of it is 12 volts dc um obviously it needs to put out a lot more than that but you know whatever we've done a lot of cleaning a lot of basically corrosion elimination in this uh this old beast, so let's find out if it'll work. So give it some free deep. And our glow plug is the old style where you hold it and then it will literally start glowing red and it actually smokes some when it does. Yeah, it's smoking. And you hold it until you can literally see the coil in there glow red. Here goes nothing.
All right, so we have power, baby. It is at least generating current for the 110 outlet, essentially the AC side of it. Now, what's happening, we are getting output on the welding leads, but what we're getting is we're getting about max of like 96 DC volts, which this is a 300 amp, basically 250 amp really output machine. So we should be seeing a lot higher amperage coming out of those leads. This is your high level setting. So this gets you in the, in the area of what you need. And then you use this rheostat. The other thing is our amp gauge is not showing amperage. And I know our, our hour meter is not clicking. It's not moving. And so we got to figure out why we're not getting voltage to our hour meter, our amp meter, and we're probably not charging on the battery. I didn't check that again yet, but something in that circuit is not right. We do have power and that is leaps and bounds beyond where we were. So I think what we're gonna do is we're gonna install the new circuit breakers. We're gonna install the new bridge rectifier, even though this one seems to be working fine. Um, the, the terminals are getting really, really thin and it was cheap. I think I paid 12 bucks for it. Um, these br breakers were, I don't know, 10 or $12 a piece as well. We're gonna clean this and get the brushes seated better on the actual um, generator portion as well as over on the exciter. And then we'll start it back up and see what happens. I will say that this little uh, diode is also something that I forgot that we fixed. That also might be part of the, the repair that has now worked because this was not correct at all. But now we've got it in the right direction and it seems to be working fine. Otherwise, we wouldn't even have any uh, power at the outlet. Totally pumped. Let's uh, let's keep going. There's other stuff I want to do to this. We need to dive into that fuel tank. We need to add back in the fuel lines. I want to change the coolant. I want to pressure wash the whole thing. So I'd like to add a working temp gauge, an oil pressure gauge, and move the hour meter all to the front here. And I'm thinking right in this area. So there's three good spots for gauges right right there that would be on the dash panel right there where you'd see it um, the other thing i'm thinking instead of putting just a switch here what i probably should do is add an actual key switch one with glow plugs by turning that way and then you got off and then on that would turn on the fuel solenoid and then all the way this way would be start and then you start it and you leave it in the key on position while it's running and then pull this to shut the engine off and then you turn the key and pull it out and then you'd be ready to rock and roll you would have the fuel shut off in the right place and wouldn't have an additional switch to remember what is it what do you do with it etc you just have that one key switch that does everything for you glow plugs and start fuel on fuel off shut off etc so Man, I am so pumped. <laughs> I thought, thought I was headed down a, a path of, well, this thing is junk and not worth spending any more time on, and we are not. We are not down that path. This thing is absolutely worth bringing back to life. So let's get a few, uh, few electronic components. Let's toss those in there. All right, here's our two breakers. Brand new 15 amp, 250 volt AC, 50 volt DC. Here's our new bridge rectifier, basically diode bridge. Put that in, and then I know I said I was gonna maybe do a key switch. For right now, I'm gonna take this little momentary switch and replace it with just a toggle switch. And that will give us the ability to turn that circuit on and not have to push the button. So I walk in today and I hear this noise. Hear that? So this hour meter was clicking away. 
So we are now at 2485. So there's about 15 additional hours on the machine. Now, um, basically what happened was I left this on. I, I replaced this momentary switch with an actual switch switch and I left it in the on position. I thought I had disconnected the battery. Maybe I didn't, but that's exactly what I thought would happen with this needing to be flipped to on, but you can stop it mechanically. So we're going to change out this switch. It wasn't really working very well. I did find um, a brand new one, and this has one of those, you know, the do not engage me things. But the nice thing is, is that it'll stick out and stand out when it's on. So if it's up like that, it has to be sticking out. So that'll be a visual thing to basically tell me to flip it to off. The other thing I'm going to add in is just a little light bulb. I found this. I cut the end where this green one is, and I added a little bit of an extension. So I'll ground that green end. This end will go to the switched side of the switch so that when this switch is on, not only will it stick out, but we'll have a light indicating that it's on. Another thing to basically tell me to turn it off. I found this. This is a, a, another flip. Basically, I don't know what you call these things, but basically when you push this down, it switches the switch off. I'm going to use this cover because it actually says on off. Um, this one doesn't say anything. Um, now, it doesn't really matter, but this one's also a little bit bolder, kind of beat up a little bit and kind of fits the machine a bit better. So I'm going to toss these in and I've gotten rid of a lot of the wire nuts. There was a wire nut through here. There was a, no, a wire nut from this wire to a different wire. Um, the only wire nut I have left is this for this, that solenoid there. But I've been cutting the ends and putting on shrink tubing and, and a better connector on a lot of these. The other thing I realized was that I was testing these leads but I wasn't testing them for amps. I was testing them for DC voltage. So that's essentially not going to tell me how many amps are going to be put out. Plus, I wasn't welding. So there's a very good chance that we hook up some leads to this and it welds beautifully. So I think what we're going to do, we're going to get that switch installed and then we're going to power it up. And I do have some leads that I brought. I, I think they'll connect to this. If they won't, we'll figure it out. I just want to throw a lead on and see if we can strike an arc. If we can strike an arc and start welding, we can start dialing in, try and figure out what, what we need to do in regards to if it's welding right. If it's welding well, then, man, we just start doing a lot of the miscellaneous stuff and start fixing up whatever. But at this point, the whole goal, like I've said before, is to see if not only does the engine run, but will it operate as a generator and will it operate as a welder? If it'll do those things, then we'll dive into the fuel tank, try and get it clean. We'll maybe do some cosmetic stuff, maybe add some different gauges, maybe uh, possibly even mount it on a trailer. I've got a trailer I might be able to use to put this thing on. And, you know, there's a bunch of other stuff I've got, you know, potentially add a DC amp gauge so that we can basically tell what it's actually outputting. Um, we've got a new belt if we need it. And then we've got a brush cedar commutator cleaner. So essentially, if we do get what we want out of this welding, we're going to do a little bit of lipstick for the pig. Um, it seems to be holding coolant beautifully. It's not leaking a drop of oil anywhere. The engine runs awesome. Um, so let's just keep going with it. Let's, let's do those few things, get that switch put in, and we'll see if we can get any welding out of it. That should work really nice. And for now, I've just got this light bulb here. I'm not going to permanently install it yet because I haven't decided if I want to do a key switch, which would eliminate this and this. And then with a key switch in there, we'd still have a light. I would still like to have one. And it'll only be on when the, uh, when the key is in the on and run position. But for now, that's what this switch is, essentially our run position, because here we've got our glow plugs, and our start, and then the middle is just like run as well. But without this switch, we can't power 
our fuel solenoid as easily. And that only matters because of the emergency stuff, the emergency shutdown in case of low oil pressure or high coolant temp. So I want to show you the, these are the brushes that uh, this welder has. It has four sets of two. These ones were slightly corroded, a couple of them are. So I just have basically taken some 400 grit and I just kind of tried to keep the same curve that's already there, but clean it up some just to get the dirt and grease and really that mouse nest that was in the bottom. I think that caused a lot of corrosion and stuff down in here that caused a lot of issues with this thing since it sat for so long. But we're gonna correct it, no problem. So clean these two brushes up. And the actual brush holder is this. And on the far side, two of the brushes were completely stuck to this base. And this base, this strap here is steel, but this whole thing is copper. And so I'll show you, basically what I do is I just kind of turn my vacuum on and then take the wire wheel not quite done but we're getting down to the bare copper and essentially that's the goal I'm gonna clean this surface off this surface is where the, the brushes actually ride so they can move and there's a spring that tensions them in there so I'm gonna get all that corrosion out of there basically clean it up enough we'll put it back in and it should make a big difference I'm not an expert in this I only know enough to be dangerous and we're figuring it out though we are getting through this machine kind of trying to whittle little things out but I really wanted to clean up all of the connections, all of these wires that go to each of the brush holders. I have taken off, completely cleaned the, uh, the nuts that hold them, the bolts that hold them on there. This one I haven't yet, but got to clean that one up. Clean them all up. I want as good a connection as we can get, and that's what we're after. Alright, I've been working on these main wires, main lead wires from the generator, and these three are totally fine there were no cracks in them no breaks in the actual insulation so i just threw a little bit of heat shrink on the ends just to protect it a little bit better this one here number four there was absolutely cracked up just like this one so you see all those cracks all the way through it but the good thing is, is the cracks kind of stop right about here so I don't have to go through the actual case to protect them. So just like on number four, we're going to slide some heat shrink tubing over this wire and basically seal up all these, these broken pieces a bit better. And then this one goes right there. So it was a bit of a bear to get this heat shrink tubing slid on because it's just barely bigger than the, the wire we're putting it on. But Let's get that one put on and we'll heat shrink it down and we should have those ready to rock and roll. We're getting ready to attach some wires here so that we can hook up some welding leads. There we go. Got all those wires all cleaned up. Only wire we have left is the actual wire that goes out to our positive lead. 
this one basically do the same thing, but we're gonna cut it and actually extend it. I don't have enough of these basically fittings for the end of the wire to be able to make up the connections I need to add my welding leads to it. So I've got some copper pipe and it's the thicker of the different copper pipe. This is half inch. So we're gonna take, we're gonna measure two and a half inches of it. And it can be whatever you want. You can do this at home, it's extremely easy. These fittings are readily available. I don't know if Napa or O'Reilly sells them, but I don't want to go get them. And I had this copper pipe laying around and it really doesn't take very long to do this. Plus I can show you something that you can do yourself in a pinch because parts stores aren't always open. And this is pretty much free if you had the pipe. We got our chunk. So then what I do is I take a, a wire brush, put it in a drill, and I run it through. And what that's for is to clean the inside of the pipe so that when we go to solder the end, it sticks to the inside of the pipe. Gets all the dirt and debris off, kind of scuffs it up some. Now we have the fun part. So you basically just take this, take your hammer, I want a little bit more. Just like that. So now our wire can go in there. We can crimp it and solder it. And now let's put the hole in it. Basically we'll do a, a quick pilot hole. Clamp this in the vise so that it doesn't spin on me. And basically just drill it down to the size you need. So I think this one, I need a about that size. So there you go. You could you could round the corners on a on a belt grinder or you know, there's a bunch of ways, angle grinder, but when you put the bolt that's gonna go through here, it will clamp these together, but we're also gonna solder and crimp this to the wire. So I've done this on a lot of old machines and it works absolutely great. Um, it's fast, boom, we have one. It's not as beautiful maybe as one that's actually manufactured, but honestly, I don't really care. As long as we get a good connection and it's, solid and secure that's all that matters so i'm going to make a few more of these and we'll get it put on the wires i'll show you how you do that too all right so off the back of the machine where the selector for the the major range of uh amperage is was this and i i cleaned up this bar and it had this insulation on it and essentially the way it worked was this was bolted to the the rear of the selector and then this a wire went from here to the actual ground lead, the negative side of it. And they used this, I think, to pull it away from the back of the panel so it didn't make contact. Well, what I did is I took the one we just made and I bent it like this at a 90. And we're going to crimp, solder, and then put some shrink tubing over this whole thing. And this is temporary. I need to get new little actual outlets for the back of, uh, for the side of it where, where you can hook it up. But for now, we're just trying to get it to weld. So we're gonna put this end on here. And here's another thing. So I was gonna take these ends off the end of the wire. Well, I pulled this back and somebody soldered it onto the actual connector instead of using the, the set screw that would have been right there. You would tighten that down on, which is totally fine. It's gonna make a great connection and so instead of taking it off, I just cut a chunk of the wire um, so that we can use this end. But I'm gonna put this back on there. Let's get this piece put on. Another thing I found 
was these little rubber grommets. I'm not exactly sure what they're for, but if I take out the metal, it actually fits really nice over the top of this, this wire here. And so I'm gonna feed these through the old location where where it went through the where the lug would have been that we would have mounted our, our wires to. So try and keep a little bit of more protection on this wire. Now granted, this is not a long-term fix. And then what you want to do is you want to flux the heck out of it. This is flux. Flux is essentially a chemical solution that helps pull the solder into the joint. So we're gonna put a bunch of flux in here, put some on the wire, put them together, then we'll heat up the fitting and then start putting solder in and it'll suck it right down in there. Um, it works really, really well. This is our shrink tubing. And if this is about right there, I want it to go all the way to that corner and then overlap back onto the wire some. So we're probably gonna use about that much. So you gotta put this stuff on before. Now this shrink tubing probably could be put on after, but a lot of times you have to put it on before you put the fitting on because then you can't get it on afterwards because the fittings are usually too big. So you also want the shrink tubing as far away from what you're actually doing as you can get it. Let's pull this set screw, this little cover screw out. Let's push this back on so it can cover. And then we're gonna put this set screw back in. This, this screw retains this cover over the actual connector end. Try and get all the little chunks of copper, all the wires, strands in there. Can be difficult when the fitting is just big enough. And that's what we're dealing with here. Next up, we're gonna crimp it. Good enough for me. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna heat this fitting, get it hot, and then add solder to it. So there we go, after a little bit of cleanup, now we'll slide this shrink tubing over it. There we go. And that shrink tubing, it shrinks down three to one and it has, it's a dual lined. It has the actual shrink outer shell. And then on the inside, it has adhesive glue. You can kind of see it squirting out right there on the edge. And that really helps to seal these joints. I've had very, very good luck with it. And I've been using it for a long, long time. I really, I really love this stuff. Electrical problems and electrical connections getting corroded is a huge issue with big machines and or anything really any machine that needs batteries or electric power um, you can chase your tail for a long time and it's just some bad ground or bad connection and really that's what this machine has been there's been other things that have been wrong with it but a lot of the issues have been just sitting the mouse nest in it all of the corroded wires um, I mean I've, I've spent hours cleaning wires that you haven't seen well we have one of the leads made and yeah, we can feed it through there, make sure it's not gonna rub and absolutely work perfect. So that's how you make simple copper ends for electrical wires. And you can do it all different sizes too if you had smaller copper, but. All right, so that wire that we just made, it's gonna go through this hole here, which is where these are the lugs that it should be, it should basically have a brass end like this. And on one side, the wire inside there connects and what that does is essentially leaves a stud and that stud is then what you would connect your welding leads to what i found online that these two replacement pieces with the plastic and this already built into it is 40 bucks and so i'm going to buy some new ones these holes here where the, those things got melted out of is where i'm going to shove these little rubber gaskets but this wire connects up here. So 
just like that. So now, on our negative side, we have a lead ready to rock and roll. And if I close, put the top back on, close the doors, nothing is going to contact the doors. Perfect. So now I'm going to work on the positive lead and getting it through here. And then we'll get the actual electrode holder and the ground on the wires. And we should be able to start it up and test it. All right, now we're going to mount this electrode holder on the the actual cable here so should be two set screws one here and one there but this one if we loosen it should get us into the cover there we got that yep there's our second set screw so the wire goes in here the wire only gets pushed down by this set screw here this set screw is literally only for the cover we're gonna basically peel back only what we need. And I don't wanna solder it in there. I wanna be able to take this off, but we're gonna put a bunch of solder on the end to make it solid so that when we put it in there, it's not pushing against soft copper. It's pushing against the soldered end of the copper wire, which makes it harder and a better connection that lasts longer. Perfect. There. Now we have a rock hard end that we can put in that lead. Now we'll put the shrink tubing on. Solid. There we go. There's our our stinger electrode holder. Magic maker. All right, here's our setup. So I extended this wire coming out of the extra generator for the positive side. And I basically am going to use this little piece that should be in here for now, mainly because I set it up with basically a bolt through lug that once I get the replacements of this, I can just bolt right to the back of this. But for now, I'm running them just through these holes. And then for the negative, I'll have to make another little small piece on the outside or on the inside to jump from the actual selector over to this here. So negative setup, this one's set up. What we're gonna do here to avoid a problem, we're gonna wrap this with some electrical tape because obviously we don't want <laughs> all that voltage going somewhere we don't want it to go. And this is the positive side, so I'm wrapping it with red. I just want to see if it welds way too much, but that's how I like it. Just for S's and G's, we'll just add a little red band right here. Let's get the leads on, let's get some metal. Let's see if this thing will burn an electrode.
Well, it welds. It actually welds pretty dang well. I, I'm a little bit uh, rusty on my stick welding, but it laid a bead beautifully. And even when I did some uh, adjusting on the dial, it did get colder or hotter depending on you know what what way I went with the dial. And that was kind of one of the worries is that you know obviously if it doesn't adjust voltage, it makes it a heck of a lot harder to use. But if it does then, man, we have a heck of a great machine on our hands. And it bogs down, but it bogs down at exactly the same RPM and sound when you're welding, consistent, and that's important. You definitely want, you know, that basically says that when we put a load on this motor, which we haven't done yet, the engine has plenty of power. And I'm really excited about that. And I basically stuck this square tube to this chunk of round pipe without a single problem in the world. And man, I could just keep going. I'm gonna clean that up real quick. We'll see what the weld looks like. It's not gonna look good, but we can look at it. So here's the first weld on this side and we're getting plenty of penetration. It's definitely spattering a bit, but it honestly looks pretty normal. This is running a 7018 rod. It's definitely penetrating well. It lays a bead pretty decent. I have to get used to it, but, and this is the second one, a little bit more porosity in that weld, but I think I had it turned up too much. See how it's really melting into that, uh, the parent metal of the square tubing right along there. It was probably a little bit high amperage wise, but, but really, I don't care. I mean, obviously this is not structural. We're not doing anything with this weld. I think some more time practicing with this thing and I'll get pretty good with it. I am excited to have it. Totally pumped that it welds. All right, I am after an exhaust manifold. I brought Scout and Maisie with me. But many of you may remember Dirty Turkey here. So this is my Gale 4625SX that I could not get running. It essentially needs either the motor rebuilt or it needs a new motor. And I have not gotten around to doing anything with it, but I did buy a brand new exhaust manifold for it. So we're gonna pop this cab up and we're gonna see if it's the right one. Well, wouldn't you know it, I think it's the right one. It's got four bolts, four bolt holes. So I brought a different exhaust manifold that I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pull this one, put the other one on this engine because I don't know if I'm gonna rebuild this or if I'm going to put a different engine in this machine, but I don't really wanna ruin this engine if I change my mind and decide to rebuild this. So I just measured the bolt pattern for this, which came off the welder and what's there. These are basically, it's two and a half inches from center to center of these bolts. And that one is like two and three quarters, maybe a little bit less than that. It is just slightly too big, but too big for what we need. So if I'm just gonna waste my time by taking that off. Unfortunately, it is not the right one. That's okay. All right, I'm gonna cover this thing back up and we'll get going. Well, since we're down here, I as well take these two for a run in the woods. So Scout is the dark one. That color is called blue. These are Weimariners, if you didn't know. And Maisie is the silver one. That's That light tan color is called silver. I love Weimariners. They're absolutely amazing dogs. I almost never put them on a leash. They're, they, they roam. Come on, Maisie. You almost can't even see her there. Scott, you can pick out a little better. Come on, Maisie. Come on, girl. Good girl, good girls. Well, I hope you enjoyed the process of getting this old welder generator up and running. I'm totally stoked about getting it to weld and generate and finally be able to be useful. So there's gonna be a part two on this and part two is essentially gonna be all the additional stuff that we need to do to it. We've done the two major things. 
does the engine run and will the generator put out electricity and allow us to weld and we've got both of those major hurdles solved a few things i'm thinking about doing possibly even putting it on a trailer that would be nice have it on a two little little two-wheel dolly that i could just tow it around throw it on a trailer whatever it might be easier to move as well as all the other things that you saw on that list that haven't been finished so i don't always like doing part twos but i truly think this machine deserves it one more video and we'll get this machine to exactly where i want it ready to be used operate and in the arsenal here at salvage workshop so as always thank you for watching salvage workshop thank you for turning in i truly appreciate your support it means so much as always you guys get out there and try something new you'll be amazed at what you can do if you just give it a try come on scout good dogs oh hi good girl scout come good girl oh hi scout oh hi yeah, I know. All right, let's go. Ready? Come on, maybe, maybe. Go. Good girl. Good girl. Good girl. Good girl. All right, come on, let's go. Come on, Maisie. Maisie, come on, girl. I know, you smell the deer. I know. Can't say enough about Weimaraners. They're amazing dogs, and I feel blessed to have them in my life. These dogs have gotten me through a lot. Yeah, get her, Maisie, get her. Have a great one.